Hey, everybody, this is Jim from Alabama. Great to be with you again. And whoo, it is a great day to be alive. Hey, we have got some exciting information for you today. Uh, I've got Gil Broussard uh, with me here again today. And I tell you what, uh, all you have to do is just turn on the TV and you will see Matthew 24, 6. That's the verse that uh, Matthew is talking about there. There are wars and rumors of wars. That's all you have to do. Turn the TV on. You'll see it everywhere. We're going to be talking about uh, things coming upon this earth during the Great Tribulation. Okay. Now, right now, we're experiencing just a little taste of tribulation. Everybody feels it all around the world. People have lost jobs because of COVID and supply chain issues, everything. But just like in Luke 21, 26, these things coming upon the earth shall make men die for fear of those things coming upon the earth. So let's talk a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about where we are now. Okay. Uh, right as of now, there are no sightings of planet 7X. So any videos that you may see or anything that says, oh, here it is, here it is. No, uh -uh. there's no sightings as of yet. Okay. What are some of the things coming up? We have Passover coming up. Okay. Now, uh, most Christians think that Passover is, is a Jewish holiday, solely a Jewish holiday. I believe that's incorrect. Uh, I believe the Old Testament and the New Testament are correct and intertwined okay so even we as christians should be celebrating all of these feasts especially passover and sukkot okay we have passover coming up uh this next month april uh, around the 17th or 18th gil's going to be talking about that uh, so there's uh, there's exciting times coming up, guys, exciting times. And I hope that you're preparing. I hope that you're preparing spiritually. I hope you're preparing your physical body um, with money, food, storing things up. And now I'd like to introduce uh, my wonderful friend, Gil Broussard. He's a wonderful uh, amateur astronomer. And we're going to be going through the whole pretty much the whole timeline of the Great Tribulation. So here he is, Gil Broussard. Well, thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be on your show. And uh, just as you were saying, we're in the time of the Tribulation. We're not in the Great Tribulation, but we're in the beginning, to, you know, we're, we're in the phases that the Bible calls Tribulation. And it does says we will go through Tribulation, which we are, many, many, Christian and Jews and everyone that going through these economic times, the viruses and everything else associated with that. And that is, that is correct. There is no sighting of planet X at the moment or planet seven X, whichever way you want to call it. Uh, there's sun dogs, there's lens, uh, lens flares, but there's, it's not a valid sighting. Uh, whenever, whenever you do see it, it will look like a comet you, and, and, 90% of the time you'll see it in a, in a nighttime sky or early morning, uh, whenever, whenever it does show. And uh, Passover, because we have a eight hour bet coming up, the barley is not ripe. Looks like Passover might be near the uh, 16th and 17th of uh, April. And that means we have one more practice run. Uh, these are not, you know, Many people call them feasts, but the actual Hebrew word is rehearsal pattern. And that's what you're to do. This is one of the ones that you are required to be in Israel to practice the rehearsal, being at the appointed place and appointed time, which is Passover and in Jerusalem. So after that is Sukkot. That would bring us to around possibly November 9th. Remember, all of these dates are flexible because the moon has to be sighted, okay? So you could be a day or two off on, on these days right here. 
So November 9th would be Sukkot, and that would be aligning if we were to look at Jacob's story where he traveled a year and a half um, to make it back to Israel. And where do we get that year and a half is from this uh, chart I'll show you, where we take the artifact, the Nebra sky disk, which is an artifact where we use astronomy to date it. It gives us the exact date, the mid of the drought, which he had a seven year drought. This was the midpoint of it. And that Jacob entered Egypt on the second year of the drought. So we can calculate that, that back to where that ties in. Then for us to figure out what years that he worked for his wives at the time, we have to take the timeline of the second temple, which was a jubilee when it was destroyed, which is actually 68. There's a two-year era in Roman history. Astronomy proves this era out that the 70 AD Roman year is actually 68 on the Gregorian calendar. So you take this back into the BC time period. That means you have to subtract a year on the eight. Uh, you have to add a year to the AD and uh, add a year to the BC to get to the correct date and time. And now we can transfer and find where the Jubilees were. And once we have the Jubilees, we can count off of that where the Sabbath years were of seven, because that's what this length of his contracts were. And that gives us uh, one particular time. And that gives us a count of him traveling to uh, Israel, where he arrived on Sukkot, it says in the Bible. And it took him about a year and a half to travel. And that makes quite a bit of sense because uh, in wintertime, he'd have to stop pretty much on his travel because he had to stay where there's plenty of food and water for his animals. So travel would in, in wintertime would have been very, very limited. So that, that makes quite good sense. It was 400 miles actually from Southern Turkey all the way to Israel. So that would bring us to this October 9th of possibly being the parallel to him making it to uh, Israel. And that may not be a practice run anymore. Uh, that would be this year, Sukkot. It has a high probability of not being a practice run. That would be the real event that we need to be in Israel. From that point on, that's when we'll probably see CO4 start which is where a war and viruses are pluralized. And it talks about one quarter world population dying. So this issue that's going on with the Miss Ukraine might escalate slowly within the next six to seven months here. That would uh, lead us to a World War III. It doesn't mean Russia and America are the ones that fires a nuclear missile first. There's other countries, especially you see Iran and, uh, uh, and a few other countries. So if Iran fires a missile at Israel or Israel has to take out a threat in Syria because it's a nuclear missile device, that would probably start World War III where each ally who has a contract with the other one would have to help the other person with nuclear weapons, basically. And this could lead up to what the, uh, the Bible says about one quarter world population dying. We don't know if it's gonna be a nuclear war that causes the death. This is a speculation. We don't know this, but tensions are high. We do know these players have nuclear weapons. And so far, every weapon that has ever been made has been used except for the nuclear weapons. Well, except for Japan, you know, it, it was used there. But uh, so this is a very high concern for me for the times that we're living in at the moment. So we have one more practice. I suggest people learn and use it to their best advantage to, uh, to learn the layout of a, uh, Missy Jerusalem, the old, old city, where the 
put put your tent for the coat and uh, get a feel for the area. Right, right. You're exactly right. You know, like I said earlier, just turn the TV on. You'll see Matthew 24, 6 right there in front of your eyes. Everything. Now, Gil, uh, this, the chart uh, that, you've, that you've made of, um, you know, to figure out uh, how long it took Jacob to actually travel uh, back to uh, Jerusalem, this chart is, is extremely uh, interesting and very intricate and everything. I, I know you took a whole lot of time uh, with that. I know you touched on it just a little bit, but can you drill down just a little bit and um, explain to the viewers how you came about to that to that year? Uh, was it a year or a year and a half, year and a half uh, time travel? Now, I know that they had children, you know, a lot of flocks and everything. I mean, these guys were basically super rich uh, for back then, you know, whenever they had cattle and stuff. But can you touch on that some more? Well, when you know that uh, first you had to figure out when he entered the land and when his contract of 20 years started. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, he stated when he went to leave Laban that he worked for him for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So... And then once he was in Jerusalem, uh, near Shechem, where he got, where he arrived there for Sukkot, he stayed there a year before he traveled to Bethlehem where Rachel had died. Mm -hmm. And she was buried into a cave. I think there's some parallels there that I may or may not get into there. But um, looking at his timeline, because remember, uh, it says how old he was uh, when he entered Egypt, which was he entered on the second year. And we can, we can, we can back calculate, and that, that took him a year and a half. Uh, because we can now lay out where the Sabbath years were and the Jubilees were. Now, this is, this is the best we can do because the Bible doesn't give us an exact uh, timeline. This is one of a few times the data is missing and there's, there's a reason for that because he says for us to be watchmen so this is an estimate this is as close as we can get using the artifacts we have it's not a not so much of a guess but it still could be off a little bit mm -hmm. so uh, the midpoint of the orbit of planet 7x was this passover okay so that means anytime that's close to that midpoint of travel is the most likely time that he will come back, you know, as far as arrival. Now, but Gil, before do you or mean, after it. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, do you mean this past Passover was that midpoint or this coming no, one? No, the coming one. Okay. Uh, okay. That, that would be using the Carrington event. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to look up the time frame for the Carrington, Carrington event. I think it was, uh, wasn't it 1859? happened in 1859 that sounds about right and uh, and that uh, let me get a, a file here to look at yeah 1859 it was april and that marks the midway point the the farthest point that our planet x or planet 7x was away from the sun because the sun reacted to it and that's what caused the cme so now that was its midway point. Now, did it run into any uh, objects or have interference from any of the other planets? Possibly. We're in that danger zone. We're in a very uh, strong area here, biblically, as well as astronomy-wise, uh, for us to look very intensely in the next uh, coming Sukkot which would be around September, slightly before that, maybe after that, whether or not we see Planet X. Uh, this is, uh, I call it, you know, at the beginning of my research, I called it a planet because we didn't have enough data, but right now I can tell you that it's a planet-sized comet is what it actually is. NASA may give it a whole new category and call it something else, but it's still going to be a, a giant-sized uh, comet. <laughs> right. This wreaks havoc on Earth. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us the next time this planet passes that it's the worst time in all of Earth's history. And um, 
there's few words that I can say to qualify that. In other words, Noah's flood was not the worst. This next event is. Right. And this this next the next event is it's just going to be beyond imagination. I mean, just like I said uh, um, at the beginning, you know, Luke uh, uh, twenty one twenty six, men's heart shall fail for seeing those things coming upon the earth, and uh, those things coming upon the earth, uh, it mentions uh, it's not it's not just like a meteor shower you know, like you go out and see, you know, meteor ping, ping, coming through. This is going to be a meteor storm and the meteors are going to uh, be the, have the weight of a talent. Now, um, this next slide uh, goes into that in, in great detail. Can you explain this next slide and uh, explain your calculations about uh, about these, this meteor storm, this coming meteor storm, and um, how you figured out the weight of a talent, weight of these meteors, and what kind of impact that they're going to have on us? Sure. The uh, uh, Revelation 16, 21 says, and there fell upon men great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. A talent, according to my accounts, when we reverse engineer the, the Hebrew units, comes up to uh, 57 pounds. And we can, um, we can calculate uh, like how large would an iron sphere would, would be if it was uh, 57 pounds. Uh, it ends up being 7.26 inches, where well, seven, seven and a quarter inches, uh, uh, you say diameter. And then you have to figure out the speed, which we use the astronomy software on the last hour of its travel, uh, reaching Earth's orbit. We don't want to know the speed that where it, where it was at its fastest point, which is right next to the sun. We want to know what, what speed it would be right at Earth. And it turns out when we measured the distance within an hour of its travel, it's traveling 97,380 miles per hour. And we're able to take that, that would be equal to the fragments, the, the comet fragments hitting, uh, hitting Earth. And that we can enter into formulas and it tells us what sort of kinetic energy we are uh, dealing with. And this is equivalent to um, let me get the figures right here. Eleven thousand seven hundred twenty-five pounds of TNT. Wow! And um, Gil, just to give uh, the viewers like a physical representation of um, of about how big that is. Um, I know you said it's about seven inches in in diameter and everything, but but uh, guys, if anybody's visited a gym or goes to the gym or anything, uh, they have these things, I believe they're called uh, kettle balls, something that's just, just like Gil's describing, a spherical iron ball with handles on it. Just imagine one of those weighing about 57 pounds, thousands of them showering down upon the earth. That's just a physical representation that you can actually go and, and put your hands on everything. Um. The next slide we have, I uh, have the uh, calculation sheet that uh, a friend of mine, a NASA engineer, he helped me with some of the uh, calculations because they get quite, quite it's in depth. And it gives us the, uh, the radiuses on certain areas of damage, whether it's uh, bodily in injury and structural damage. So I was able to plot these rings on a map on this is just remember this is just one uh, comet fragment hitting the earth and you just like Jim said there's thousands and thousands of them so the inner ring the first inner ring which is in red is uh, 2,931 feet radius you have a pressure zone right in that of 1,373 pounds per square inch. 
the wind speed is 8,788 miles per hour within that ring. This is, you're instantly dead within this first red ring. Instant death happens. And then if you go out to the second ring where the uh, uh, cyan, uh, that's 4,465 feet, uh, PSI is at 55, wind speed 70, 1,759. And then you go out to the next one, that, which is another red one I've placed there. That's 20 PSI at, uh, at 4,780 feet radius. Winds are 1,061 miles per hour. Uh, this is the 100% fatality ring right here because the first ring is when everybody's dead. It's this, this second red ring that they will die within the next you know, week or two from the injuries because your lungs are injured. You have uh, flying debris, everything. Your uh, organs are damaged. You, you die within, within days, hours or days or weeks, you know, but, wow. but that's a fatal, that's a fatal zone. Wow. And, and, and just to give our viewers uh, like a physical representation of that, um, just imagine guys, a, a normal tire on your car uh, is inflated to, you know, any anywhere from like 35 uh, to 45 pounds uh, of pressure. So just imagine if you're right there in front of that tire and it just explodes right there. Uh, Gil has this on his previous chart uh, as, you know, uh, threshold of lung damage at, uh, at that, uh, those pounds per square inch. Uh, and also, uh, your eardrums, eardrums would be be uh, completely ruptured, one hundred percent. Yes, um, uh, depending whether or not you have the full force of the uh, uh, pressure wave hitting you. Now, the last ring for the damage where where the glass in the uh, buildings are cracked, uh, that's over five thousand one hundred seventy-seven feet radius. The winds are 119 miles per hour, and that's at 0.25. That's a quarter of a pound pressure, right there, of, of, of one psi, and that that will break and shatter uh, windows in homes and such. So uh, this was quite shocking. Uh, I didn't I didn't realize that a comet fragment. You know, at first we did meteor strikes, but it's not a meteor. This is a comet. A comet travels many times faster. Uh, meteor would travel maybe 40,000 miles per hour, where this is uh, traveling, uh, let's see, um, 70, I think, let's see, what is it? Uh, 97,380 miles per hour. This, the kinetic energy associated with this is, let me see, immense. And Gil, this chart, this chart here, that just represents just one of those correct. Uh, talents, correct? Correct. I mean, uh, just a, a little town that I'm in, about 16,000, it only take like two, two to three of these to wipe out everybody in the town, just about. Wow. You'd, have, uh, you'd still have some injured, but the majority of the town would be wiped out or, or, or devastated. And... Um, the uh, keep in mind a storm shelter underneath the ground. In most of this area, you would die anyway. In most, I don't know which ring it would be, equal to a storm storm shelter underground. If you were underground at the time, the shock wave would still bruise your brain and cause massive damage. Um, you probably have to be something like uh, 30, 40 stories on the ground. And then um, your entrance would probably cave, uh, cave in, therefore you're locked, you're locked on the ground. Right. Uh, the Bible says for the ones that go on the ground, that's their tomb. I, mm -hmm. I think that's a very good estimate. Right, right. Well, Gil, let's, let's talk about uh, uh, some of the effects uh, on this next slide of, uh, what the planet has done uh, in the past, the uh, the, the plasma um, 
catching our, our planet and what has it done to our orbit uh, in the past? Well, in the past, we can go back and look at, uh, we have uh, records throughout multiple, like 20, 30 civilizations that state around the time of Hezekiah, which is exactly when it happened. We have an artifact that gives us the date and the hour that this even occurred. Uh, that's the uh, Nebra sky disk. And that's when the calendar year changed from 360 to 365 and a quarter days as it is today, right now. Um, Isaiah in the book of Psalms says, now the feasts are connected to the moon. Okay, before that, you didn't, you didn't need it because it was 30 day months. You didn't need a moon to, to count. They just needed to know when the barley was ripe to make the first fruit offerings. And you started counting 30 days after that. But after the calendar changed, we had to have it linked to the moon, which is the Hebrew calendar today. And I was curious on how far did Earth's orbit change? Remember, uh, to go from 360 to 365, it had to go outward. The, the orbital path of Earth had to expand to where it gives us 365 and a quarter days. The calculations tell me that Earth moved 1,333 miles to its new orbit. Well, if you use Earth as a, as a unit of measure, Earth is 7,917 miles across and use it as a unit of measure. How many Earths, the bodies of Earth would fit, in other words, into this distance. It moved Earth 168 diameters of it outward. It pulled it away from the sun, 168 diameters. Okay, so what's, what's interesting is Enoch is talking about a future date in a, in a, near, in a near future now uh, that will be 364 day year. Well, that's never occurred. The only two dates that, that we've had as far as the calendar year was 360 and 365 and a quarter. So this is a future event and that's gonna happen when Wormwood uh, hits Earth, which is the second meteor shower, uh, which is 150 days away from the first meteor shower. We have two of them. And this is when in, in that meteor shower, a large mountain-sized asteroid hits Earth, which is called Wormwood. Uh, Earth is split, it says, uh, fractured. Uh, that M... Uh, impact according to the bible says it's uh, every wall on earth is either cracked or crumbled and it hits us on the nighttime side of earth the first one is there in the daytime second one is at nighttime the second one pushes us slightly closer to the sun and according to the calcs for it to change our orbit to 364 that means it has to move us basically 40 earth diameters closer to the sun Wow, that is absolutely amazing. That that just uh, shows you the power of this thing. I mean, uh, m something grabbing hold of the Earth and dragging it through space 168 times its own diameter. And right. We were we were we were dragged on the first one, but the second one. Remember, we're being. This is the impact that that's that's moving us to 40. Mm -hmm. Big difference. <laughs> oh yeah. Big oh difference. yeah. <laughs> So, um, well, let's talk about uh, let's talk about this next slide here. Uh, how the um, uh, Gulf of Mexico uh, was created. You know, if if anybody looks at a map, they can kind of see kind of a a little circle there, like you know, going through uh, Florida, Alabama, uh, on over Mississippi, Louisiana, like that. It, it kind of sort of looks like a circle. And uh, there was a, actually a study uh, done several years ago by a team of researchers that actually concluded uh, that that was a, um, a meteor strike, but they were told not to say anything about it. I cannot remember the lady's name but I just remember that uh, that she was threatened. Her position at uh, the university was okay. Threatened. She didn't say it was the Gulf of Mexico. She said there was a larger one that 
the Chichiclu was not the one that killed the dinosaurs. And right, she was absolutely right, right, correct right. that there was a larger event. Right. And she almost lost her career. She said uh, we had uh, we had called her and talked uh, talked her, mm -hmm. and she said she would never wish uh, she, she she wished she never made that statement because it changed her her career. Even though it was a team of scientists that she just announced it because the team concluded this. Right. It was an international team. Uh, they had people from France, Belgium, Germany, and so on, and they concluded this, and then it right. ruined their uh, uh, career by just making that statement because they yeah. don't want people to know this. Right, right. But, if you're if you're over the target, that's when you're going to get the most mm -hmm. flag. Yeah, the uh, Yucatan and Cuba uh, was much further south. They were uh, there's a crack in the Gulf, uh, well outside the Gulf, that's uh, causing those two. Uh, land masses to move north north uh, uh, uh cuba is moving more like north and then the yucatan is more moving northwest but if you place them back down where they were before in south america was touching cuba at the time or and uh it makes a ring it makes a perfect ring a circle you can see a lake is cut in half at florida uh a crater rim makes a double rim. You can clearly see the uh, double rim off the coast of Florida. Uh, the landmass of uh, half of Louisiana has collapsed into the Gulf once, and it's fixing to do it a second time here. Uh, that's why there's so much oil there because it's buried plant uh, plant life. But my first calculations, I had calculated it with the speed of it being a meteor. And uh, that would have been something like 210 miles across for a uh, meteor to hit to make 1100 mile crater. But if it's a comet fragment traveling at the same speed as what we quoted earlier of the uh, 97,380 miles per hour, it only needed to be 50 miles across to make the same size crater the Gulf of Mexico. And this happened at the end of Noah's flood. Whenever I remember the Noah's flood started and it was 40 days of rain. And then it didn't, the water didn't recede until the 150 days later. That's when he said a great wind uh, and he saw the water misrecede. Well, that great wind was the pressure wave from the, from the impact. Uh, it knocked off 71% of our crust globally on the, on the backside of the, it wasn't in the Gulf of Mexico that this uh, Missy debris is uh, lost. It's on the backside of earth that it knocked it off. 71% of it uh, is exact volume of our moon. Uh, there's an error in the Bible where it says uh, that he made the moon and the, and the stars. It doesn't say that in Hebrew. Moon is not there. And it doesn't say, and the stars. It says he made a greater light and lesser light. And the lesser light was the stars. That's what it actually says in Hebrew. The, the physical name moon, it's not mentioned till the dream of uh, Joseph in when he was 17. That's the first time the word moon is mentioned in the Bible. And right. that was some, some, some time like, what, 600 over 600, 700 years after the flood. So. Yeah, and Gil, I think that we talked about this before, but um, after that impact, uh, all the debris that was like in basically a low uh, outer space orbit around Earth, uh, didn't, it, didn't it take uh, like three or 400 years uh, for that to um, come together yes. into what we now know as the moon? For it to coalesce, uh, the uh, NASA has pictures showing that the uh, uh, they were able to uh, categorize sections of the moon, it was, and it's pieced together with large chunks, mm -hmm. which they don't have an answer for that. <laughs> right. And uh, the uh, um, the German scientists that come up with that said it between two to three hundred years. Well, it's closer to three hundred years because we have an artifact during the time of the, uh, when the Tower of Babel was destroyed, it dates it. And it shows that, that we had a moon at the time. 
and um, and so he was he was actually correct. It took took about three hundred years for it to form, for it to coalesce into a uh, spherical shape. And you know, isn't it isn't it odd that um, you know we uh, have had men on the moon that brought samples back and everything, but you know it's uh, it's a federal crime to own uh, any kind of moon dust or anything like that. It's, it's probably because if anybody analyzed it, it would have the same composition as is uh, the Earth's crust today. Well, they've already uh, analyzed that. They said that uh, the samples where they took, remember, they didn't take it in, you know, all over the uh, uh, moon. Right. But the samples, the first samples that they were testing said it was tested to the same consistency at the bottom of the ocean. Hmm. Well, it depends on what side of the continent or crust that, that you're testing. Because whatever way the piece had landed, whether or not it would be the bottom of the ocean, which would be the inside layer instead of the top, hmm. That's exactly what you would find, that it would be the same uh, consistency of it because that's where it came from. Right, that's an excellent point. Right. And uh, remember where there, there was an article where the moon rock they gave to the Netherlands uh, was petrified wood, and they assumed that it was a fake because it was petrified. Not necessarily. <laughs> Not necessarily, because it came from Earth and it had petrified uh, uh, a wood probably throughout the ages because it doesn't take long for wood to be petrified they've already proven that if it's in the right if it's in the right conditions so um, that's probably came from the moon and they just didn't notice it it was petrified uh, wood <laughs> oh my gosh, wow. and they and even if they would have found samples from nasa nasa would not come out and tell you they found petrified wood in there they would not Anything that proves out the biblical story, just like they're not willing to say the Gulf of Mexico is a meteor crater. Well, they claim that there's a problem with heat. Well, there isn't a problem with heat because the earth was flooded at the time. Therefore, the impact that was a second event, mm -hmm. it, it hit when the earth was flooded. Therefore, it cancels out the heat issue. So you can have such a large impact. And uh, they're just not calculating it correctly. Right. And uh, I believe you have a slide uh, that that shows uh, the seismic rings and everything of that uh, impact that you calculated, don't you? Yes. Uh, the size, you know, they had the seismic ring, they had the fire, the fireball, they have uh, the crater and everything. I, I show that. Now, keep in mind the fire, the fireball would not have occurred like, like that because it's the the whole earth was flooded at the time, it would have quenched a lot of the heat issue. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, the, the, these are my, re, this, is, this is what I recalculated to uh, figure out at the speed of uh, 97,000 miles, how big of an object would it take? And it ends up being 49.7 miles across. Wow. And, and it's a steel object. You know, a com most common fragments are used metallic, um, very, very dense. Yeah. And so, yeah, this what, is these are dangerous objects that are coming towards us on this next on the next event. Right. Well, Gil, we we certainly appreciate all all the time that you spend doing these calculations and everything. I mean, they're they're just absolutely fascinating. But let's kind of go back uh, just a little bit to um, you spent you got to spend some time in China uh, with uh, with one of your past jobs and everything. And uh, this was back when you really weren't uh, aware or didn't believe that there was like a, a, a another object out in space, you know, that could come by and do this. But you found some documents uh, that led you down this path that you've been down for for many years now can can you uh talk about those documents a little bit sure uh, i spent almost a year when i was in the oil field in uh, china and uh i was most of that time <laughs> i only had about four weeks of work the rest of the time i was on standby so i was able to go to all of their museums and a bunch of other than not all of them i have to say it's a lot of them but it wasn't all because there's there's a bunch and uh, I was able to take pictures of um, 
artifacts and everything like that. But I wasn't interested in Planet X yet, not until I came back. And um, a lot of the stuff I saw on the internet didn't make sense because it was violating a lot of principles of astronomy. And, um, and at that time, I knew what a lens 